How, how many of you guys are already CCA agents? Anybody? A couple? How, how many are, think, are thinking about going for CCA? A couple? Ian, routing and switching, or which? Our resume? Okay. Uh, so, uh, like Tom said, my name is Brian. Uh, I have a few CCAEs. <laughs> um, <laughs> been doing this for uh, too long. Uh, since uh, uh, 2002 is my uh, first one. Last year I got data center. Uh, so hopefully no more uh, beyond this. Uh, my big thing I'm working on now is the uh, the new changes for uh, routing and switching v5, which basically uh, was just last week that they launched it. Um, so I feel bad for the poor guinea pigs that were in the lab last week that had the brand new format. I uh, haven't heard of anybody pass yet. I have heard some people that, that got there and kind of got their ass kicked, so they weren't too happy about that. Um, but uh, well, I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit here about what, what did they actually change in the exam. Uh, one of the real big things that changed was the hardware specification and the software uh, specs. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, strategy for the lab, and then of course the uh, the sales pitch at the, at the end, which is the products that we sell uh, for the uh, for CCIE. Um, if you guys want to see this presentation afterwards, you can go to this URL, uh, ine.co slash china03. Um, because there's a bunch of links, and, and I'll post this up again later uh, when we're done, because there's a bunch of links in here you might want to go to afterwards, uh, like what books are good to read for preparation um, and, and some other slide decks and stuff. Um, I did uh, recently uh, attend uh, at Cisco Live. They had their, you know, their big conference in San, uh, San Francisco a couple weeks ago, and they, uh, they run these, uh, these tectorials where basically the, like the program manager for the CCA was talking about you know, what were the changes uh, that they're doing and what, what are they trying to accomplish uh, doing it. And this one here, this is the PDF, uh, his slide deck of it. Uh, and then the, the one below that, that's like a, a, a link to my blog where um, as I was asking him questions and, and people, other people were asking him questions, basically it talks about um, you know, some, of the, uh, some of the more specific stuff that he was talking about. So if you, if, if, if you do click on that link, you can see, um, uh, see some more information about it. I'm not going to go over it in detail right now. Uh, but the big thing that changed is, uh, well, actually, there's, there's two big things that changed. There's, there was a new format that was added to the exam, uh, which is now called the diagnostics section. And the other change is that all the equipment is virtual now. So the big issue is that the topology is now arbitrary. You could get to the exam and there could be 40 routers in the exam. So it, it, from their point of view, the idea is that if I'm going to build an MPLS network, it's hard to build an MPLS network with four routers. So since, since now everything is running virtually, it gives them a lot more flexibility as to, as to what type of stuff that they can test on. Um, not necessarily that you're going to get there and have eight hours of BGP configuration to do. It's just it makes it more flexible, you know, for, uh, for the stuff that, they, uh, stuff that they can test on. Um, the, the other big thing is, is what topics were removed, what topics were added. Uh, the big one that was removed was frame relay. And then, yeah, right, like probably should have been <laughs> removed ten years ago. Um, and then they, they added some new... Uh, uh, some some new topics. So th this is the, the the list. You can get this from the um, the actual blueprint. And I'm not going to go uh, over each of these line item by line item. Um, there were some specific changes to the written exam differently than the um, the lab exam. Like for example, they added um, described chassis virtualization and, and aggregation techniques. Like uh, this is what Cisco would call like virtual port channel on Nexus or VSS on the Catalyst lines. But since they're not actually using those platforms in the exam, they don't test on those features. It's just that they might ask you, like, you know, why would you want to use this in your design? What's the, you know, what's the overall goal of it? Um, so, so some of this, this stuff is new that you would need to know about just from a theory point of view. Like, what's the difference between iOS and iOS XE? This would be like on the ASR 1000 platform. Uh, a lot of the new Catalyst switches new that run this new version of, of iOS, iOS XE. It basically, it's, it just adds like another layer of virtualization. The idea is that like if the iOS process crashes, then there's like another hot standby one that's, that's, that's running because it's basically like a VM on the, on the back end. 
Um, another thing is um, IS to IS. Uh, does anybody actually run ISIS in production? Yeah, does anybody know what ISIS is? Okay. It's branded at M layer. At M layer, yeah. So um, it's actually making a big comeback. It's making a big comeback because of Fabric Path and uh, overlay transport virtualization, which is another of those tunneling techniques, overlay, underlay technologies. Um, basically, it's like you want to build a big layer two fabric, but the problem is spanning tree is not going to be able to handle that. So one of, one of their solutions was to say, well, let's just run ISIS on the back end, and then let's route the traffic, but let's not tell the customer. Let's make it look like they're just bridging, but we're actually routing the traffic and they don't know about it. Um, so they, uh, they, they added it back in just from, uh, from a, a theory point of view, but it's not going to be tested on uh, from a configuration point of view. Same with a lot of the other uh, tunneling techniques, like uh, layer 2 VPN wireline versus LAN service. So like I have an office here in Chicago, and I want to connect it with a layer 2 circuit to New York. So do I buy an actual physical fiber, or do I just you know, pay an MPLS provider to make it look like they're actually connected when, the, uh, when they're not? Uh, group encrypted uh, transport is, is kind of an interesting, uh, kind of an inter interesting technology. Has anybody ever run this before or heard of this before? This is um, a scaling technique for IPsec that allows you to have all all routers agree on a group encryption and decryption key. Because one of the one of the big things that that IPsec has a problem with, like let, let's say you have a thousand retail offices and you want them all to be on the same uh, layer three network, so they, you want to be able to route the traffic to each other, um, but you need encryption, like for PCI compliance or something like that. The issue is that if, if you want any to any connectivity, each of those routers is going to have to form a thousand tunnels, and it's going to have to have a thousand encryption keys, a thousand decryption keys. So it's, it's, a, it's a big scaling limitation in the, uh, in the control plane. GetVPN solves this by just saying, let's all agree that we're going to use password X to encrypt and then all use password Y to decrypt and then we only have one uh, set of keys that we run in the, uh, the, uh, in the control plane. So the, it's like any of these technologies, a lot of it just has to do with the buzzwords that you read the marketing information, it doesn't really tell you what it, what it means. It's just a way to, to do IPsec without having to keep you know, 100 different copies of passwords or encryption keys for all the, uh, all the tunnel endpoints. Um, but the, uh, a lot of customers that I see also run this in conjunction with, somewhere should be in here, uh, dynamic multipoint VPN. So uh, DMVPN is, is basically, you could almost take the legacy frame relay designs and then just plop it on top of DMVPN and it's, it's the same thing. So the idea is like, you know, maybe I have two data centers that are wherever arbitrarily somewhere reachable in the internet. And then I have all of these uh, like retail locations that I need to, to get access to them. So previously we might buy you know like dedicated DS1 circuits or T1, DS3 for larger sites, stuff like that. But then you run into a, a scaling limit of you know maybe AT and T is not available at this site, and you know I have to buy my circuit from British Telecom. Are they going to be able to interoperate something like that? So um, the DMVPN is a, a quick and dirty solution for this. Because, it, again, it's another tunnel. So you run an overlay network, and then you're able to route the traffic however you want. Um, but then the issue that you run into is that the more sites that you need to add, the more load you add on the, the control plane for like the encryption and decryption. So you, you hit some sort of scaling limit, like even no matter what box you add at the core, it can't handle a million tunnels. So, a lot of people nowadays are starting to, to run both of these together, get VPN on top of DMVPN. So then you, you kind of remove the limitation of, like, if this is properly designed, I've seen cases where there are literally hundreds of thousands of sites on the DMVPN. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty interesting design, but it's, it's, you could almost, like, say, just replace it with frame on a one-to-one -one basis, and it's pretty much the same thing. Um, but this is the reason they added in IPsec. But it, it's not a very large scope in the overall uh, uh, topic domain. So the, the exam in general is a, is a layer two, layer three routing infrastructure exam. Hence the name routing and switching. So there are certain like security techniques that they might ask you about. Like in this case, you know, it says IPsec, uh, DMVPN. But 
it wouldn't be as in depth as like uh, the actual CCI security track, which would focus on things like um, uh, like remote access SSL VPN client or uh, you know all sorts of other variations. Without getting into, into too many details. Um, so this is, is now covered, but it's not really that, uh, that large of a scope. Another thing is, is they, they added um, some of the new routing scalability techniques and routing convergence techniques, uh, like describe BGB fast convergence feature. Uh, like there's a feature called uh, BGB prefix independent convergence or BGB pick, where the idea is like you, you make BGP behave like eHRP does where EHRP says I have my primary path and then I pre-calculated a backup one. So what happens if my primary path comes down, I don't want to have to recalculate, I just want to switch over. So uh, BGB has this feature now, it's called BGB Pick. OSPF has this feature too, it's called OSPF LFA for loop-free alternate. Uh, or, uh, listed in here somewhere. Uh, actually, I think it's under there. Just implement, troubleshoot, optimize OSPF's convergence and scalability. The, the real big issue with this, and this is basically the, just like a cut and paste from their blueprint, a lot of their stuff is still really, really vague. That implement OSPF, I mean, that means 50,000 things, literally. So, um, you, th from the, th this is like a, a good high-level um, overview, and, and I actually forgot to add the link uh, in here. But, and I'll update this afterwards so you guys can have this, uh, this link if you want to. I basically went through their blueprint and then just made a, a, a much more detailed copy of it. which is the expandable blueprint. Uh, this is basically the outline that I wrote that I use for uh, the, the class that I'm currently running that I'll tell you guys about in a, in a little bit afterwards. Um, but the scope of this certification is insanely huge. So it goes on and on and on and on and on. But the, the point being that one of the big problems with CSA in general is that you can get to the exam and they can ask you a question and you have no idea what they're even talking about. So the, based on what they say is the blueprint, some of it is so vague that you, know, you don't know, did I waste the last six months on irrelevant topics that aren't going to even be tested on or you know, what, what is realistically within uh, the scope. So I think um, versus, versus the other blueprints they did, make this a little bit more detailed and, and, and uh, give you kind of like an upper ceiling to say, you know, you don't need to worry about call manager because call manager is not in routing and switching. But um, at least for me personally, if you look at their blueprint from a learning perspective, it wouldn't really make sense to start at the first item and then work down. Um, so that was, is basically what I did here is, is to reorder this into, is, into like a more logical manner. Like when you learn about BGP, you would want to learn about, you know, how do you turn BGP on between two routers? How do you establish a peering? You wouldn't want to say, you know, how do I learn about confederations or, you know, some large scalability technique before you know the, uh, the basics of the, uh, of the technology. And, and this actually goes back to, and what I'll talk about in a couple minutes here is, is just general preparation strategy. Um, and a, a lot of us have this problem where you think you, mo you think you know more than you do. And over the years, the more that I learn, the more that I realize I don't know. And it's when, you, at least for me personally, and I see this in, in a lot of people that are kind of early in their career, they get a little bit overconfident, like, oh, I know BGP, I know OSPF. I've been studying OSPF for 10 years, I don't know anything about it. Like, it, you'd be surp like surprised how complicated this stuff can really get. And and that's one of the big things is that you need to, to have some sort of realistic expectation of, you know, what is the scope and when I'm going through these topics, can I make a realistic dis, uh, uh, determination? Like, do I really know what, um, 
you know, how DMVPN works or, or, or uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and, and I'll come back to that in a second. So beyond, um, uh, beyond these other uh, additions, this is probably the biggest one here, uh, implement DMVPN from a configuration point of view. There's also a bunch of other stuff that they, they moved uh, from the lab exam to the written which means that they, uh, they're not going to test on the actual configuration anymore. One of the big things here is uh, layer 2 QoS. On the, uh, the catalyst switches, and the reason why is that all of this is implemented in hardware. So like if you have a catalyst 6509, your, con your QoS config for one blade is going to be completely different than another one, depending on well, like what the ASICs are, to, are, in, are in the card. Um, but since they went to a virtual topology, the virtual switch doesn't emulate the ASIC, so it can't support the, uh, the QoS config. Which is kind of good, because if you were to do, to do this in production, it's not something that you know offhand anyways. You're going to reference the QoS guide and say, you know, this is the template config I need to build, and then I'm, gonna, then I'm actually going to deploy it. Um, some of the other stuff, like uh, uh, iOS AAA with TACX and RADIUS, that probably would be more appropriate for the security exam. Something like .1x as well. Um, which, um, if, if you guys know anything about what, basically what dot one x means is that you plug your port into the network and then the network actually asks you to authenticate before you come on. But the amount of, of detail and complexity you can get into it, it's insanely huge. It's basically what Cisco markets as uh, BYOD, bring your own device. So it's like you want to log on the network on your phone or you want to log it on your laptop. Well, you know, what, you, what is the device you're coming in? Is it an iPhone? Is it running iOS 7.0? And, and if so, then you get this particular profile. So they do test it heavily in the security exam, uh, but it's, it's a huge scope on its own. Like you could run a five-day class just on .1x. Like it's that complicated, honestly. Um, then identify performance routing. Move from the lab to the written. Has, has anybody taken the V4 C side before? For, in, for anybody that was actually in that boat, this was like the bane of, of everyone's existence for C side version 4. Uh, performance routing is basically like their, their first attempt at SDN, where you have one router that controls all of the other ones. And then it makes decisions like based on your link utilization or based on like your latency. Tell the routers to change the routing table to route traffic outbound a different way or inbound a different way. So in, in theory it's good, but in reality it doesn't really work. So yeah. Um, is anybody actually run it in production? Has anybody tried to run PFR? We 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 have a project in play Tom loses too. That you're about to deploy it? Yes. It was, not, it was not my design yeah. so before I came to the company, but we're, uh, we're planning on it next year. Yeah. And, and there's, some, in there's somebody that's really out of the power right now. So, like, I mean, like with SDN, it's a, it seems like a cool idea, but, but it's, it's, like, it's like you're giving the keys to the network like over to Skynet. And it's like, what happens when the network becomes self-aware and it's like, I'm not going to route your packets, you guys are, yeah. So, uh, but it's, it's kind of a cool technique. I think they've kind of abandoned it. Um, in, uh, in favor of like the in-semi stuff, like the, the ACI and stuff like that, where, where it basically was the router would be your controller. But now, you know, it's, it's probably not realistic to do that, at least in large scale. It is kind of an interesting feature, like I've seen it used in um, like it's small branch office deployments where maybe you have one router but then you have two uplinks, like you have a DSL link and you have a cable modem and then you want to do some sort of like load distribution based on you know, latency or something like that. So it, it is kind of interesting, um, but uh, I, think it, I think in version four, the questions that they were asking in the exam was like the open TAC cases. For PFR, they were trying to get the, the lab candidates to solve the problems. And they're like, quick, close the case. He got it actually working. So that one, so this is the big thing. Every, a lot of people are happy about this, that they got, they got rid of performance routing. Um, the ones that were completely removed 
uh, FlexLinx ISL Layer 2 uh, Protocol Tunneling. Some of this has to do with the hardware support. Um, like FlexLinx is like an alternative, uh, alternate to spanning tree. It's like saying this is my active path, this is my backup path. Um, ISL trunking, basically nobody uses it anymore. There's no reason for it. Uh, frame relay is, is the huge removal. Uh, WCCP, which is actually still really relevant, but it's relevant more for security, which, um, um, what was that that you were called talking about, like the chain of authorization of the service chain? Service chain. Service yeah. chain. Like the WCCP is, is related to that. Like you could say, when the packet comes in, redirect it to my IPS first and then redirect it to my proxy and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it, it is still relevant, but it's, it's basically it's too complicated to have within the scope of routing and switching now. Um, same with iOS firewall IPS. So, so that stuff is, is uh, very large within the scope of the security exam. Zone-based firewalls today? Uh, Zone-based firewalls not. Yeah, so, so most, of the, most of the true security features um, are gone just for the, uh, the, the, just for the security exam. Uh, router IP traffic export in Armon, which basically nobody used anyways. Um, RGMP, actually I, di I didn't even know this was a feature until I saw it was removed. Then you Google RGMP, RGMP like the only hit is the CCA blueprint saying that RGMP was removed. <laughs> um, RSVP, QoS, uh, weighted round robin and shape round robin, that's, that's more layer two like hardware, uh, hardware QoS. So, in, in reality, there wasn't a lot that they added and a lot removed. The big thing is the replacement from uh, DMVPN to, or from Frame Relay to, uh, to DMVPN. Um, the, the big change in format for the exam, though, and you'll see that if you look at the, um, the, the official, go back to it here. Uh, the official pre presentation they did on Cisco Live. And in a couple of weeks, I talked to the program manager about it the other day. They're, he they said they're going to post a demo of uh, what the new is it opening? Where is it on the wall? This. The first time I used a computer up here. Sorry, guys. I just click on that. Uh, this? Yeah, so go back to the video. That's not the new one. And then click on the other. There we go. Oh, it's on this page. Sorry. Uh, so this is their actual presentation on it. And the, uh, the big change they made was... Uh, so they added a new section between troubleshooting and configuration. Actually, I should, should take a step back. The, the, the way that the exam was formatted before is they gave you a, a big network that was made up of virtual routers that was pre-configured with all sorts of stuff like routing, VGP, MPLS, all that stuff is pre-configured. Uh, but something is broken, and they give you a, a very vague description of it, and then they say, fix it. It's like router 1 can't tell that to router 20, fix it. Well, there's 19 other routers in the path. Like, it could be anything. Um, so that's where the exam starts, and then you would go into like a, a small topology of configuration where it would be like build OSPF from scratch, build BGB routing from, uh, from scratch. The, uh, the, this new section diagnostic in the middle is, um, and let's see if they give, uh, It's kind of like you're working at the help desk and the customer calls in and says, the internet's down. Well, what do you mean the internet's down? Well, I can't get to Google. Well, can you get to Microsoft.com or whatever? And you, you have to go through the, you know, like a logical workflow to figure out not necessarily what the solution is, but based on all sorts of pieces of information, what would be the logical way to diagnose what the problem is? Um, so it's it's still kind of you know up in the cloud that not it's not really clear exactly what they're testing with it, 
Um, but it, it, it's not on actual equipment. It's where they'll give you like maybe like a Wireshark capture and they'll give you some, some documentation like this is what the network looks like and this is what the customer is reporting is the problem. And then you have to correlate all of that together and then come up with the, you know, whatever based on the question that they're asking. So it might be like they give you a big list of things, what could be the possible problem, check all that apply, but there might be like 20 possible options or something like that. Uh, so th they're, they're supposed to post a, a, uh, a demo of it here within the next like week or so, um, but somewhere, so here the, is this the actual format of it. It's like uh, a new service request was escalated to you and the following information was provided. So I don't know if you guys can read this, but it says like, uh, here's the email thread from the customer, here's the network topology, here's the config, here's the traffic capture. So based on all this info, what is the problem? The problem is that somebody made an EITRP config mistake on router 9. Or the problem is that there's an access list that's missing on one of the interfaces, something like that. So it's, it's more kind of real world experience, I would say, where it would be very difficult or nearly impossible to try to brain dump something like this. Because they could make just minor changes in the information they're giving you, and if they give you 20 possible options as the answer, you know, there's, it's, it makes it real easy for them to, uh, uh, to kind of make the, the questions a little bit more dynamic. Um, so uh, th there's also a video that's, that's, uh, that's along with this, which is if you, um, if you search this number, this is like the, um, uh, the tutorial number, they call it on, on Cisco Live. It's tech CCIE 3000. Um, and also, if, if you guys have never seen this before, there is a site that is called Cisco Live 365. Let me do this over here. There it is. Cisco Live 365. And then up here and search the catalog, uh, you could search for all sorts of, it's, this is not related just to CCIE, there's all sorts of stuff you could search here. Um, like for example, let's say like SDN. And then basically what this is, is all of the, all of the sessions that they run at Cisco Live, they videotape them and then they give you the actual presentations. So if you've never seen this before and it's free to sign up, you just create an account there. And then there's, there's all sorts of great information, especially on emerging technologies. Because let's say like, for example, ACI with the Nexus 9K, like the Cisco sales engineers don't even know how it works yet. So someone here from the BU will come and say, okay, this is ACI, this is what it's going to do. But there's no documentation out on it yet because no one's actually used it. So you'll see a lot of good information about things that are up and coming. Like here, this was just this year, SDN for the service provider. It says, using the Cisco Quantum WAN bandwidth planning and optimization tools. So you'll see, like, they'll have the stuff about the 1PK controller and, you know, a lot of the new technologies. But if you search, like, CCIE or you search OSPF or BGP, you'll, see, you'll find tons of hits here. There's a lot of good information uh, that's, that's located here. Okay, so the other big change then was uh, the topology. So this is, this is right from their website. It says the configuration portion of the exam is now delivered using virtual devices, just like troubleshooting. Uh, virtual routers and switches will be used throughout the exam, supporting more realistic and bigger network topologies to improve the reliability of the test while focusing on concepts rather than focusing on specific hardware platform uh, peculiarities. Uh, peculiar, uh, because the, a, a lot of these, especially a lot of the newer technologies, they're really, really hardware dependent. Like uh, the Fabric Path on Nexus, for example, there's like two line cards total that support it. Um, so they're trying to get away from 
something that might be obsolete in three years because that hardware path that we tried to go down didn't work out. But OSPF is OSPF, BGP is BGP. So they're, they're saying, we're going to test on just the, the, the general concept and the core concepts more than these kind of these outliers. But the way that we're going to do that is, is to run it on basically VMs, and then the topology is arbitrary. So specifically, um, what they're using is, uh, so they're saying if you want to run hardware to do this stuff, you still can. The equivalent boxes they're saying to use would be ISR uh, G2s, which are like the 2900s, 3900s, or uh, the Catalyst X series, which is like 3560X, 3750X. But if you guys are trying to build your own lab to, to study for this, the hardware itself doesn't matter at all. The only thing that matters is, is what's the feature set that you can run. So this is, is was kind of a, a, a big thing of, of contention in the past that, you know, you could buy 2500 series routers or, you know, even some of the newer ones like 1841s and you can get them a good deal like, you know, $50, $100 on eBay. But the issue is that the, the topology is going to be 40 routers. You know, do you even have room to, to host 40 routers to build your lab? So you could do this in hardware still. Um, us personally, we're not. So if anybody wants to go to Reno, Nevada and get like a like a uh, a forklift and pick up a couple thousand routers, we have them sitting there. You guys are welcome to, to have as many routers as you want. We have them sitting around our data center. They're going to go in the garbage because um, the the old topology in the exam was was really uh, really fixed. Like in, and this is not their topology. This is what our topology looked like. But the point being that if you're locked into this physical wiring, there's a limit to how many different things that you can do with it. Um, so the, the, the new exam is all virtual. And the, and the way that we're doing it is by running uh, 20 logical router instances and then using, uh, using the physical switches still because there's, there's some sw stuff you cannot do in their vSwitch, um, which is their, um, it's called iOS on Linux, IOL, that you can, uh, you can run to do it. So it just makes the, the topology much simpler. Like if you look at it from a high level point of view, these are just VMs that are running in VMware or they're VMs that are running in, in, in KVM. Um, we kept the switches as physical, but in, in the exam they're not using physical switches. All, all of the stuff is, is logical. Um, so if you do want to build a lab, and, and I can give you guys some more, more specific information um, offline if you have questions. And the way that I'm doing it personally is, is with CSR1000V. I mean, has anybody heard of, of CSR 1000V before? What this is, it's, it's Cisco's production compile of the ASR 1000 code onto a VM. So the big thing with this is this is what runs in Amazon Cloud, or this is what runs in Rackspace. The idea being that if I want to spin up new servers in the cloud, how am I going to route to them? Do I want to run some Linux box and run, you know, uh, IP tables or something to do my security? Probably not. You want, you know, a normal interface that, like, your network team is used to configuring ACLs. They're used to configuring routing and stuff like that. So um, CSR 1000B, basically, they just took, took the iOS XE code, which is what runs on ASR 1000, and then they compiled it for a VM. So you can run it on ESX, you can run it on KVM, you can run it on, uh, on Zen. So then the idea, what's, what's actually really neat about this in a real design is let's say that I want to uh, spin up new servers in the network, whatever, web servers or whatever the application is. And then when I want them to join my internal topology, this router supports DMBPN because it runs the full iOS code. You could have some script that says turn up 100 web servers, but I want to distribute them across every single data center that, that Amazon has or that Rackspace has. So I want some in Sydney, I want some in Tokyo, I want some in, in uh, US West Coast. Then configure the routers to, to do an overlay tunnel and then automatically join the routed network. So then when I actually go to reach them, I can route internally uh, to them like over the VPN instead of having to configure some sort of you know, like complicated uh, box on the other side. So this is what we're using for the exam. The reason why is because it's very, very stable. It's, it's meant to be a production router. It actually does do forwarding in the data plane. So uh, I maxed it out with some tests. Like, you can get 5 gig throughput on this VM. 
Um, there are some other options, though, like you can use GNS3, like as we had the, the last meeting with, the, with Stephen talking about GNS3. Um, personally, I don't think this software is still very mature. I know they put a lot of development resources into it, but the issue is, is still that they really don't have a chance when they're competing against the actual iOS programmers to write this. So, and you, you end up in a lot of strange issues where, especially, especially within the scope of, of CCIE, that if I'm, you know, spending 10 hours on a Saturday trying to learn OSBF, and I can't figure something out, how do I know if it's a problem with the GNS3 software, or how do I know it's a problem with the actual uh, iOS box? So, most stuff works, and it's great because you can, you know, do your own design, spin it up on your laptop and play around with it and stuff. But I don't personally like to use it a lot because you run into weird problems that it's, it's like counterproductive, that you end up wasting, wasting more time than if you had done like a, you know, a, a better solution to begin with. And the only difference really, though, um, is the hardware requirements. Like GNS3, you could probably run 20 routers on, I don't know, maybe like 4 gigs, maybe 8 gigs of RAM, something like that, in your laptop. The CSR 1000V, since it's a production router, it, it needs a lot of uh, physical resources. So um, I have some, we build like, uh, uh, like white box servers, like uh, Supermicro or you know, whatever vendor, not like Cisco UCS that's 10,000 times the price of what the, what the standalone server is. So we have these big boxes that have like 512 gig of RAM, and you can spin up probably like maybe 300 instances or so per box. But if you're preparing for the lab, you don't really need 300 routers. You need, you know, just a, a smaller subset. So um, you can get away with this. And there's, there's a lot of people, especially on my forum, uh, that are talking about what would be like the minimum server specs you would need in order to actually build this. And then there's some interesting techniques you can do. And, and I'm not an expert in, in VMware and, and virtualization and stuff like that. But I, I know there's some things you can do, like you can, you can uh, get the routers like, to address the same memory space. So it tricks them into thinking they have dedicated memory, but they don't. It's like sharing the pages or something like that. Um, so um, there are some ways that you can cut down on the resources, and then people are running like 20 router topologies on their laptop with it, basically. Um, of course, you could use physical boxes still. The big problem is that the, uh, the ones that run the, the code that the exam needs, they're expensive. So if, if you look at like uh, 2911 or so, with the full licenses that it needs used, it's probably like 1200 bucks on eBay. Um, the other ones, if, if you have some of the older ISRG ones, like 1841, you can get those for like 100 bucks or so on eBay, give or take. And they officially run iOS 15.1T, but I found some super secret compile that, they, that you can get them to run iOS uh, 15.3. So I'll, uh, um, if you guys are interested, I could show you the link. There's, if you have, if you have the uh, file name and you search for it, you can find the version of 15.3 that runs on these boxes. So you, you could use a physical lab it's not going to support 100% of the features, but it's, it's going to support probably the vast majority, like 90% or more. Um, the, the switches, they say use Catalyst uh, X, which uh, is good because it's going to support all the features, but the problem is the license is, is expensive for it. Um, the, the other option is the non-X versions of those same switches, like Catalyst 3560. The issue is that uh, there's very few of these specific part numbers that will run the actual image that you would need. Um, and uh, if you want more, like I said, if you want more details on this, you can always email me or you know, talk offline. I can get more specific. But there's certain part numbers that, will, that have larger flash that will boot these images even though they're technically not supported. Because you're not going to use it in production. You don't care if the switch crashes. It's, it's just that you need the, 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 uh, the software feature support for it. But the difference is, like, you can get 3750 for, like, 100 bucks. 3750X is going to be, like, four grand. We've got to take off.
Okay. All right, so um, the, the rest of this uh, presentation, you can, like I said, you can find the link for it here. Which is uh, ID.co slash uh, Chinago3. And um, we also will have the presentations on our website. As well. Yeah, we'll post them on there as well. Um, the other thing also. Um, if you, if you guys are are serious about actually doing this uh, to do RSV5, um, there's a there's a class that I'm currently in the middle of, which is um, our advanced technologies class. And, and let me talk about that just real quick uh, before we finish up. Basically, the um, advanced technologies class it's it's a live online class that I run, where I talk about the technologies and then go through the actual configurations. But the thing is that I don't pre-script any of the examples. So I'll run into troubleshooting issues. And if you can basically look at what my methodology is that I would apply onto it, it helps you to build a structured approach of how you should prepare for this type of stuff or how you would face this type of stuff in the exam. Um, so it's, it's a live class. And um, the, the first week we already have posted as recordings. Uh, the second week starts this Monday. But if you guys want to attend this, uh, we have what's called our um, All Access Pass, or AAP, basically, which is like a, it's like a, like a Netflix subscription type thing, where you subscribe to all of our videos. Um, but the thing is it, is, it gives you access to the online classes, too. So if you guys want to attend the class, just send me an email, and I can give you a free subscription to the, uh, to the videos. And then uh, the class starts, or the class continues this Monday, but the thing is, since the, the topic scope is so large, the RSV4 class, when I ran it, I ended up to be about 80 hours of videos. This one is going to be, probably, I think, about twice that size, so probably about 150 hours. <laughs> but that's why it's recorded. So a, a lot of people will just like stop in the class to watch a section or two and then ask questions. But all of this stuff is compiled to recordings you can watch like on your phone or your iPad afterwards. Um, but if you guys are interested, let me know. Um, the big advantage of this is it's an actual class. So if you want to ask me questions, like you can type in the Q&A session, and then I answer them live uh, in, in the class. Questions, guys? I just have one question yeah. real quick. Yeah. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves of these, uh, these Cisco Xanon written mm -hmm. is field sizes for protocol like PEUs. Are those going to go away? That's a good question. I I have that same kind of beef with them where the yeah the like because the the last track that I took was data center, and they had a lot of questions that were I thought like inane details about UCS, like for example it would be like if you had an UCS B twenty two M three blade and you have an Intel E five sixty CPU, and you have 384 gigs of RAM, what's the maximum bus speed that the memory can run at? But then it's like, but two weeks later, that blade is end of sale. So I haven't taken the new written exam because it just went live, but in general, they're trying to stay away from stuff like that. I mean, you go to any engineer, engineer and say, you know, what's, what's the MPLS um, <coughs> label size for the PU? Yeah, because well, I, I mean... Well, I know it because I studied, but they'll go through one. Exactly, because, I mean, that doesn't... It serves, no purpose. it serves no purpose, exactly, because it's not really technology understanding, it's just memorization. I'd rather have a practical, here's how to do it, yeah. trying to remember yeah. bit size. So, in, and um, me and one of my other uh, instructors, Brian Dennis, we, um, we talked to the program manager about this last year at Cisco Live, before they actually implemented the changes, and that was his beef, too, that the, the program manager is that we're kind of to the point where we're doing a lot of like stupid router tricks and things like that, where we would ha rather have it be more practical, where the idea is that, you know, you can't brain dump the exam because it's based on real world experience kind of type of thing. So hopefully that's what it's going to be. So I'm going to point out taking it probably in two months. So yeah. I'm kind of curious if it's going to be there. Yeah, so hopefully not. Okay. Yeah. Tom? 
Any uh, gut feeling on what's going to happen to the pass rate when they have this massively expanded... Uh, well, right now, the pass rate is probably in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it'll probably average out. I think the, the issue is that they look at stuff like that, and they look at the statistics, and then they say, well, you know, maybe this exam is not feasible to do in eight hours, so we'll cut it down or we'll, you know... So they don't, they don't really try to hit like a specific pass rate or fail rate. It's not like there's a hard cutoff. They can't say like, well, we already gave 10 CCAs away today, so you guys are out of luck. You've got to come back tomorrow. So as, as long as you meet the criteria, you, 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 you pass. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Thanks, guys. So uh, we're out of time. Really bad. But I just want to show you where we're going after this. Because this is not over. <laughs> um, the best part's next. So, uh, let's see. Oops, one quick one. Okay, so the uh, village tab. So if you just get off right here, take this, uh, what is this command? Campbell. Campbell, all the way to, uh, to Roscoe, and it's Honey and um, Roscoe. I actually live, like, right here, so I know where we're at. This... This is where the Jewel is here, and this is the Mariano's, the, the, the two grocery stores. So that street right there is Roscoe, if you just take that straight down. This is the bar, it's like right across the street here. There is a, uh, um, it's kind of, the, the sign is kind of hidden. It's, it's next to a uh, Vietnamese place called Bon Mi and Company. So if you see that, that's on the corner of us, right there. Uh, yeah, so if you could please come. Uh, I can talk to you more about our next event that's coming up in September. Um, well, what else we're doing? What are what's on our roadmap? And a lot of stuff that we didn't have a chance to go. So, and then uh, they're going to make a special drink for us called the Network. I don't know what it is. It is a surprise. <laughs> so hopefully you guys can go and see it. And uh, some of the craft beers are on uh, this conference. So, uh, we have a uh, garden, beer garden open in the back. So just yeah, go all the way to the back. And, uh, that's what we'll do. If anyone needs a ride, you know, I can drive. Awesome. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.